Hello and welcome to Next Phase, where we examine the intersection of health and technology and talk about our future to come. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Jane Holton. Now, I'm going to get Jane to introduce herself, but she's led a distingu distinguished career in the public sector, um, where she's been the Secretary of the Department of Health for many years, um, and now, having retired from that role, has picked up some significant leadership roles in the commercial sector as well. But Jane has um, taken lead roles in the World Health Organization, the World Health Assembly, and currently she's part of the National COVID Coordination Committee convened directly by Scott Morrison to help shepherd us through these challenging times. Jane, it's a delight to have you on the program. Thank you, pleasure to be here. Good, could you start by filling in the blanks, some of what I might have missed that you think is important and relevant, and then we'll jump into some of the detail. Yes, certainly. Well, you haven't done a bad job actually, Simon. So um, the thing I would probably add to that list, and it, it is pretty well known, I think that I've had a lot of time uh, chairing things in global health, but probably the most important thing that I do that's like that at the moment is that I'm, I'm the chair of something called the Coalition for Epidemic Preparedness Innovations which is probably better known by its acronym CEPI, although as Fran um, tends to do on Radio National, she keeps calling it CP. Um, but basically we're doing a lot of vaccine work uh, to actually try and bring this pandemic to an end. So we've been established for about two years, but the, that chairing role is obviously, it started as being little known and I think it's becoming much better known. So that's a particular privilege to, to, to do that role as well. Great. Well, there's obviously some things you can say and some things you can't say, um, but we'd love your insight for some of those things that are on the public record. And certainly we've seen your opinions around on live TV and in the media recently because you are playing a lead role from a public health policy and personality perspective. So could you talk me through a little bit about how you saw this pandemic unfold? I think you recognised the challenge long before many of the rest of us did. Mm. Well, it is certainly the case that if you have had, as I have, a long-standing interest in um, biosecurity and the kind of hazards and the, the risks that we run from something like a novel virus, um, you're probably more alert and alarmed to these issues than many others. So as I think I've said publicly, I got calls in very late December and I've also reported that I was in the US um, airport, the first call that I got, in relation to a novel um, and unusual looking pneumonias in a place some of us had heard of, but most of the world hadn't, Wuhan in China. Mm. And so yes, basically from the end of December, and you vacillate in the early stages of these things from thinking, oh, well, no, 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 it can't be anything real, that and just the kind of nasty feeling in the pit of the stomach. So certainly at CEPI, we uh, stood up a committee very, very early in January. We, uh, something that people would know, got access to the genome sequence in early January from China. And that meant that we could actually start a group of people around the world working on vaccine candidates. And we were the first uh, body in the world, I believe, to actually uh, put out a call for proposal and ask people to come in and work with us on vaccine development. Now, of course, now there's lots and lots of people working on vaccines, but I am pleased to say that of uh, the nine candidate vaccines, uh, we were actually funding at that particular point, seven of them are now in human trial. And again, many people would know that it's difficult to make a vaccine, but we're hopeful that at least we will get one or two of those across the finish line. But we've been learning, Simon, I think as everyone has, uh, what this pandemic looks like, uh, what the ecology of this virus is, how do we deal with it, what might be uh, better treatments, uh, how might we better provide care to people who end up in intensive care and on ventilators with this disease. So. We're all learning. Uh, no one's got the answer yet, but we certainly, I think, are probably in a better position now. Here we are um, towards the back end of the year than we were in January or February. It's fascinating to hear the behind the scenes work because that's the role of um, the public health departments and international organisations to do the planning for scenarios that the rest of us might not imagine. So should they ever eventuate, then there is a plan in place. So from what it sounds like with your work at CEPI, you've recognised that there's a global race 
for a vaccine, you've decided to form a collaboration early, and that's given us as Australians an opportunity to access a vaccine wherever it might have been developed in the world. Mm, we certainly hope so. And the COVAX facility, which is a joint initiative of Gavi, the Global Alliance on Vaccines and Immunisation, ourselves, um, with technical advice coming from the WHO, that's a first ever kind of initiative where precisely as you say, the objective is actually uh, to make sure that the most vulnerable around the world, and I'm talking health vulnerability here, um, so regardless of high income country or low income country, we're hoping that we would be able to vaccinate that 20% of uh, the population in most countries who are vulnerable because as we know, uh, while one country still has this virus running loose and while people haven't got coverage, we're all as vulnerable as each other. So there's quite a lot of work to do here and to, there's a way to go yet. But yes, that has been our objective. Um, and it's good to see now a whole bunch of countries come on board with this sort of work, but we've been uh, working pretty hard at it since January. Yeah, and the fact that we've got two potential front runners here in September is actually pretty extraordinary. That's the fastest development for a significant vaccine that the world has ever seen. Now, I know that the best and the brightest are on it worldwide um, and that the lay public are kind of saying, why don't we have a vaccine already? But those of us in scientific and medical circles were even more sceptical. How do you see it? What do you think is the likelihood of realistically getting a practical vaccine um, in time soon? Mm. Well, certainly, uh, I think the public, uh, one, they don't understand how these things uh, actually get created, and nor should they. It's not their day job, so there's no need for them to, to be immersed in this sort of science. But when I'm explaining this to, to the general public, I say it's important to understand that this isn't like a chemistry experiment where you get a test tube and you put a whole bunch of stuff in the test tube and then you either add heat or you stir, whatever it might be, and voila, we have a vaccine, there's a huge amount of engineering, of science, of um, really good uh, manufacturing practice, all the things that we know about that goes into just the production of a vaccine. But we also need to know it works, it's safe, who it works for, and then of course we have to think about how we might transport it and then administer it to the people who need it and who are eligible for the particular vaccine. So. There's a huge amount of effort. And to your point, we have never worked at this speed. So CEPI was actually created um, nearly two years ago now, precisely because there were these priority pathogens which nobody was working on. Why? Because basically, unless there's a commercial market in something, uh, you don't do and you can't fund the work to actually uh, develop candidate vaccines. And as it happens, the coronavirus is one of the viruses that we chose off the top 10 list from the WHO as being one of our first priorities. And people might be interested to know that the University of Queensland vaccine, which we have hopes for, let's be honest, as proud Australians, but in any event, they do good science at the University of Queensland. What we um, did was we put out a call for proposal uh, nearly two years ago now um, for what we call platform technologies. And those platform technologies are able to be applied to a number of different virus types. And so one of the virus types that um, the University of Queensland platform proposal, uh, which was to use something called its molecular clamp technology, they, came, they applied as part of the CEPI global core. And I was delighted that on purely scientific merit, that group in Queensland we awarded funding to. So the technology that they are using now, so they came in in January and applied to take that technology and actually um, apply it to this particular coronavirus. Uh, so we gave the money for the platform technology. They've then taken that platform technology and the objective was that you would go from genome sequence to a candidate vaccine in 16 weeks. Wow. And breakneck speed uh, but that is what they have done. So uh, I, I feel very pleased that what we sought to do in providing funding is now literally turning into, we hope, um, a successful vaccine. So a thing that we didn't think we would be testing anywhere near this uh, early, but here we are testing it. So fingers crossed.
Well, that's not the first time that Australia has punched on the world circuit well and truly out of its weight. Um, we've got some great research and scientists here in Australia. That's fantastic. Um, I don't want to ignore the fact that you're part of this committee that has privileged insight into the impact of coronavirus in our society in general. Um, and you are uniquely positioned to help us understand what that new normal is. So what can you share about, with us about this pandemic that all of us thought would blow over relatively quickly? And here we are now um, at the back half of the year looking like it might go on uh, for some time to come. Yes, that's exactly right. Well, I think it's firstly important to, to understand. So the COVID Coordination Commission was established by the Prime Minister precisely to make sure that all parts um, of our society, but particularly our economy, were working together to address all the unexpected things that have been going on around us. And I'll give you an example of that. Uh, whilst we have had pandemic plans for many years, and I've exercised personally a couple of those plans in my time in government, I can say with complete confidence the thing nobody predicted was what happened with toilet paper. <laughs> Who'd have thunk it that toilet paper would prove to be uh, this lightning rod, it's probably a mixed metaphor, isn't it, um, <laughs> for people's anxiety? And so people went and bought toilet paper and then they bought more toilet paper and then they bought yet more toilet paper and I could go on, etc. So, of course, what we discovered is that the supply chains we have for all manner of things, but particularly toilet paper, those supply chains were actually a bit fragile. So what we've had to do is look to see how it is our economy and our society works and then figure out how to actually plug some of those gaps. And the kinds of examples we've seen there are, um, and most people may not know this, there are rules that prevent big semi-trailers turning up to restock supermarkets in particularly our big urban crowded settings um, during the day. Now, if you're having to move toilet paper around quickly so people can access it, you actually have to resupply, restock supermarkets, not just in the dead of night, but during the day. So the COVID Commission has been looking to work with business, um, work with communities to actually solve the kind of problems none of us predicted but also to make sure that we can keep as many people employed as is possible and to also see what it might be that we need to do in terms of changing a policy or uh, you know, any manner of things that will assist at what is a very difficult time. And to your point, uh, it is true. Here we are at the back end of the year. Uh, we are not going to be out of this for some time yet. Hopefully we have a vaccine. In any event, we will undoubtedly at some point get better treatments. But in the shorter term, what we have to do is figure out how to run our lives in a way that is that new normal, that COVID safe. And that does require changes in behaviour and it requires people to go about their business differently. And I'm sure everybody watching this is now completely adept at Microsoft Teams mm. and Zoom with <laughs> Zoombies. Um, and then we use all other sorts of techniques and apps and what have you to communicate with each other. We're doing our business in different ways. So the challenge, and certainly we're seeing this at the Commission, the challenge is how do we support people? Um, how do we um, find creative ways to solve problems? And how is it that we can keep people going while we wait for those treatments, uh, vaccines, etc.? And unlike the, the GFC, it was a financial and a liquidity crisis. What this is, uh, a health problem, it's a health crisis, which now has economic consequences. It's not that our economy is fundamentally unsound. On the contrary, it was very sound. We were the longest running uh, without recession country, I think, of any country that there are um, decent measures of, you know, nearly 30 years, which is astonishing. But in common now with the rest of the world, we're in recession and what we are trying to do at the Commission is protect um, people as best we can and work with people so that they can keep their businesses going and that they can get the health care they need, etc. So you mentioned how quickly we pivoted to digitally enabled ways of life and some of those were heavily digitally enabled already. Our health system, not so much. Yes. And as we come up on time, have you got some observations about our health system that, in my opinion, has some 
maturing to do in terms of its digital enablement and embracing of digital technologies and what it looks like for the health system going forward? Certainly, and this has always been one of my great passions. Um, the whole time I was Secretary of the Department of Health, I, we have the huge opportunity to use technology to actually improve patient care. And that is something that we should all, I think, be dedicated to. And you're right. What we've seen in this period is this phenomenal amount of change in, and particularly adoption of e-health, be that, um, you know, telephone or digital video consults. And people have taken to it like ducks to water. Now, we know that if it's got the proper framework around it, you can actually provide good quality care to people. And we know that places like Kaiser Permanente in the US have a huge proportion of their consults. And I think it's over 70% are done uh, using some sort of digital mechanism. So the combination of much better digital records, um, which means uh, you are you regardless of where you turn up, and that means you're gonna get better quality care together with a way of accessing the kind of people you need as part of your care team. We've seen great leaps forward. What we don't want to do is slide back from where we are now, but we will learn, I think, and we need to, to ensure that what people are getting is a quality service. So certainly um, there's huge opportunity here. Um, I'm really pleased. I mean, I think we've had 10 years worth of change in about six months, um, but let's keep going with that because in time, this is the way of the future, not only for productivity, but for better patient outcomes. Yeah, Jane, it's wonderful to have you as such a prominent public figure in health as an advocate for some of this um, to prevent that slide back. Please keep on campaigning. We need your support on that. And thank you so much for joining us today on the show and sharing some of your views. That's been my absolute pleasure. And everyone stay well out there. Thanks, Jane. Bye now.